So we talked about what the circular economy is, why we want to bring it to different regions uh, throughout the, our state of Indiana and uh, throughout the United States. Uh, we also talked about a lot of success stories proving that the circular economy and sustainable development is already uh, applied successfully in many places, in many communities, in many types of uh, uh, businesses, uh, large and small. Uh, but since we're in Gary, uh, the city of steel, or the city that was founded on steel, uh, we would like to talk specifically about steel, steel making, reviving steel making for a circular economy. Uh, and what is interesting is that the World Steel Association has adopted the idea of the uh, circular economy and they are promoting it heavily, so that's very helpful to us uh, as we're thinking about revitalizing local manufacturing and taking advantage of a long tradition of steel making in Gary and in northern uh, Indiana. Uh, steel is really a perfect circular material because it is long-lasting, uh, easy to maintain, uh, almost 100% recyclable. It has all the characteristics that we're looking for uh, in the circular economy. It requires the advanced and low skills. It requires the advanced and low technology, so it can be made small scale, large scale, in an advanced way, less advanced way, uh, but, and it can be applied in many, many uh, uh, uses. Uh, so, uh, as uh, they uh, like to, to show, the World Steel Association, uh, it can reduce, uh, um, the, reduce the amount necessary of steel, therefore reducing greenhouse emissions uh, in automobiles. It can be reused, uh, so uh, if you have uh, a building that are being deconstructed, you can reuse almost all the structural steel in other buildings or in other applications. So it can be uh, kept in a loop for a very, very long time. It can be remanufactured, so if you have a, a product of steel that has been damaged from axle, and uh, we just have a, had a nice uh, car breakdown on our way here, and I wish I didn't have to drive my car, but could be on a train, but that's another story. Um, so if my axle is broken, uh, it could be easily remanufactured, and remanufacturing is another big uh, characteristic of uh, the circular economy. And as I mentioned, it can be recycled uh, forever. So uh, we, can, we can take advantage in Gary, in, throughout Indiana, in all the other states that we're trying to re-industrialize on a better footing, on a more sustainable footing, uh, use that expertise in rebuilding our uh, steel industry. And I mentioned trains, that's not a coincidence. First of all, I'm a big fan of, of trains. I, it's not my opinion, but they are the cleanest means of uh, mass transportation. And what's the connection with the with steel? Well, the connection is that if we were still making railway cars, railway tracks, we would still have a flourishing steel industry. And we, uh, if we would have kept pace with advances in, advantage, uh, advances in railway technologies, we would be where France is today. So I'm showing you uh, their uh, super fast train uh, that they call TGV. Um, it, in uh, 2007, it just broke uh, 357 miles per hour. Um, but on average, they are running around 200 miles uh, per hour, and they are running almost every hour. So they're uh, almost like commuter trains. I can attest to that because in France, I do in three hours and a half the distance that I would do here in almost 20 hours. So it's very, very sad for me that we allowed this industry to uh, not to make progress, like in other countries. And I think we should we should. Uh, uh, discontinue that and, and reconnect to the most advanced technologies. 
uh, railway construction, if you remember from our history, was, was directly connected with a flourishing uh, steel industry because you're using steel in everything uh, in this industry. Now, there are some companies that are reviving um, uh, rail transportation, not only long distance, but uh, for cities. And this is a company in Oregon, United Streetcars. They just inaugurated their train car in Washington, D.C. But they are the first uh, American builder of modern streetcars, which is another means of transportation that we unfortunately abandoned. So my message is for us to be very demanding uh, of uh, elected officials, of businesses in our choices. So I, I would ask all of you to be very active in, in requiring that we bring back, back trains. Uh, again, we would not have been late here if we were on a train, uh, I mean a, a modern train. Um, and pay attention to what, uh, what uh, uh, you know, state and local officials decide to do. Uh, when they invest in a major project. So when they say, well, I'm going to invest in repairing the highway or I can be in the railway, uh, please go for the second option. Uh, uh, so, but definitely we do have railways and we have an excellent freight transportation. Uh, the passenger side is really weak and behind, but the freight is excellent, probably the best in the world. But do we make anything for, for it? No, so these are the top manufacturers of U.S. rail cars, and none of them is American. Uh, which explains why uh, all the steel industry has, uh, has gone, among other reasons, has gone under. And remember, you know, uh, Pullman was a major and probably among the first uh, rail cars manufacturers. Uh, no, the, those factories don't exist anymore, uh, and that's uh, very sad. Uh, so, in a few years, when we, when we meet again, I think we should see this pie chart uh, completely uh, change and see some, uh, maybe Pullman will uh, come back or some other manufacturer. And we're talking steel making, circular economy, good jobs. Um, our topic in particular in Gary was about good jobs and restoring a flourishing community here and everywhere throughout Indiana. Uh, there, there have been studies made that show uh, how many jobs could be created if we bring back um, uh, rail car manufacturing to the United States. So there are different scenarios. I won't uh, dwell too much uh, on the numbers, but clearly if we're going to be similar to what uh, international investment is taking place in rail cars, we would create uh, 225,000 jobs, some of them direct, some of them uh, indirect, and they will be really good jobs because they're, again, advanced skills, uh, advanced manufacturing, servicing of, of uh, a rolling stock is also an advanced technology, uh, so it will be overall a, a great advantage if we uh, request that, again, we revive uh, rail transportation along with the steel industry. Um, and here is how, how investment looks like and how we compare with, uh, with others. Uh, so for four years, uh, China invested 750 billion and we invested two. No wonder the steel factories are, have gone under the rate, the, all the manufacturers that were um, connected to uh, rail car manufacturing uh, have gone under. And that's, uh, that's uh, really sad. So that's what, something that we want to see reversed. And then what happens with other, with the community surrounding rail transportation? Um, they're also abandoned. So uh, on the uh, left you see uh, the Detroit uh, railway station, which was built at about the same time as the one on the right, which is a main railway station in Paris of 1890s. Um, um, uh, sorry, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, 1900s. 
So one of them is abandoned because there is no railway transportation. The other one is flourishing, has been extended, it has a whole uh, section that is only for the fast uh, trains. And then the whole surrounding area is flourishing because you bring on commerce and uh, uh, people um, going at the cafes, walking around, you know, you big taxi transportation. It's really, uh, railways have always been uh, major anchors of communities and it is, it is very sad and unacceptable to me that we have uh, abandoned them. Um, now we might say why necessarily railways are you know, cleaner since we're talking about sustainable uh, development and a sustainable business. Uh, there are cleaner means of transportation like ships so it's okay if we bring that rail car from, from China. Um, well, um, it's not really okay, and I'll show you why for many reasons. One of it is, is the jobs that were uh, uh, outsourcing uh, by going uh, at, a, at a very far distance. Um, but if you look at the whole transportation of, of uh, merchandise from far away and not source them domestically, not manufacture them locally, which is another of our messages, uh, throughout this series on sustainable Indiana that we must develop and try to make as much as possible locally and as close as possible to the consumer, the client, the user. So if you, if you break down all of the chain of transportation of bringing a shipping container of apparel, for instance, for instance uh, from China to an American store, uh, then the uh, environmental picture uh, changes uh, completely. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, we're talking about sustainable transportation as it relates to, to steel manufacturing. So we should be looking at the means of transportation that are the cleanest, and that is uh, uh, really trains. Uh, where else uh, is the steel uh, being used? In almost every infrastructure um, that we can think of, but uh, Bridges are a big example, and if you, if you visit Pittsburgh, another um, splendid uh, steel city, you see how beautiful the, the steel bridges are, and they're much much longer lasting than concrete or anything else. Uh, and they're also pieces of art. Uh, of course, we, we didn't maintain them very well in the United States, and unfortunately, the moment uh, uh, one had to be replaced in the Bay Area. It was decided for, for very bad reasons to be uh, completely outsourced uh, to China. So we really built um, a bridge far away uh, from, from America, which doesn't make uh, any sense whatsoever. And of course, it's costing much more than the projected uh, uh, initial uh, number. Uh, but this is why, this is a big explanation on why we don't see steel industry coming back. Everything has been outsourced. So all those jobs, instead of uh, uh, being created here or being maintained here, were, were outsourced. Well, fortunately, some people have uh, much better ideas. So this is a comparison between a new bridge built in uh, uh, New York uh, with U.S. steel. Um, only 3.9 uh, billion uh, projected uh, cost um, on time, created uh, 7,800 uh, 7, uh, uh, jobs, uh, and it is designed to last 100 years without major structural maintenance. Um, and if there are maintenance issues, again, the people who build it and the people who made the steel can solve it, uh, can solve those uh, immediately. Um, so, again, this is an example of how pretty easy it would be to revive uh, steel manufacturing, provide excellent jobs if the decisions on infrastructure are the right ones and if we're involved in those uh, decisions. I suppose nobody asked them in, in San Francisco where the bridge uh, uh, should be built and by the time people found out it was uh, too late. So uh, the message here is no more outsourced bridges and I totally agree with that. Steel is everywhere. Well, uh, 
I am in particular, uh, in particular very fond of steel. Um, as a mechanical engineer, I, I consider it a super wonderful uh, material. Um, and you can find it everywhere. So uh, either as an individual consumer, you can look for steel and substitute it for many other materials, definitely substitute it for fossil-based plastic, which is a disaster in itself. Um, so uh, steel can be used in um, uh, appliances, in buildings, uh, in renewable energy, which was passed by the beautiful uh, wind farms along uh, Highway 65 in Indiana. Um, and speaking of those, uh, here they are. Um, so all that project, uh, among many other things, uh, increasing uh, the use of renewable energy in uh, Indiana's uh, energy portfolio, but it also created jobs. It's true that only installation and commissioning jobs, but if we would work, if we were to build these <coughs> windmills here, we still made in northern Indiana, everybody would uh, would win and we would be able to close that uh, circle that we're, uh, what we're after uh, for uh, Indiana, a circular economy. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, household items uh, made out of steel, and again, they are the best ones, uh, the most resilient. Uh, uh, you can maintain them forever. And this is another manufacturing that we have uh, uh, abandoned, un unfortunately, but there are still, there are still uh, some uh, companies that held on. So this is American Craft Cookware in uh, West Bend, Wisconsin, one of the few ones that still make uh, uh, cookware uh, in the United States. And uh, uh, nothing compares uh, with the uh, healthiness and uh, uh, elegance of a stainless steel uh, uh, cookware, so I highly recommend it. Uh, here is another example of household items. This is also the, the only manufacturers in the States that makes uh, uh, cutlery, uh, and uh, uh, they're explaining on, on, on their website that there are many reasons, some obvious and some subtle, to purchase products made in the United States whenever possible. As supporters of Made in USA, we believe that preserving manufacturing jobs is critical to maintaining a strong economy and economic independence. In addition to employment, there are many other reasons to purchase American-made uh, goods, including environmental issues, social concerns, and health and safety considerations. Um, I bought from them, and I can tell you that they're, they're uh, sending you a label with all their environmental uh, processes and how they ensured that during fabrication uh, there was uh, no toxicity um, used in, in, in their fabrication. So they, they really care about not only selling their, their wares, but selling it in a sustainable way, making them in a sustainable way, and making them from a sustainable <coughs> material, which is uh, steel. Um, furniture, um, I again, I like much better uh, metal furniture compared to wood, uh, and speaking of wood, it would be best to leave it where it is, in the forest or wherever they are, because uh, they're the best carbon <coughs> sequestration technology that we can think of. Um, and wood needs a lot of maintenance, but still, again, it's forever. Yes, you need coating, you need uh, painting, but once you get it uh, uh, ready, it will last uh, forever. And again, there are some manufacturers uh, or, or craftsmen uh, that have decided to maintain this uh, uh, industry. Uh, one of them is Bell Manufacturing, selling through Room and Board. This is uh, the Room and Board is a furniture a retailer based in uh, Minnesota, uh, and they sell a lot of uh, primarily made in America uh, products. So not necessarily, I'm not promoting anybody in particular, but these are excellent examples of businesses that resisted the temptation to offshore and to look for the. Um, lowest uh, uh, labor cost, and they're very proud to uh, manufacture uh, locally, to manufacture with materials that are sourced uh, domestically, um, and um, 
um, so they are, they are making a lot of uh, uh, steel furnishings. Um, and what do they uh, say? Um, when we approached the Bells, this is the Roman board in 1990 with designs for ex an exclusive line of hand welded steel furnishings. What can be more beautiful and uh, uh, elegant but something that was made by hand for your house? Um, they welcome the opportunity to, to apply their talent to something new. Um, I also mentioned among, among uh, uh, technologies that, uh, that fit in the circular economy, 3D printing, uh, and if you were wondering if steel can be used in 3D printing, yes it can. Um, so uh, here is a company in Vancouver, Washington, uh, making uh, 3D printing filament out of uh, uh, stainless steel um, and uh, their motto is also uh, they are a creative, professional and fun filament made in the USA by Proto Plant where craft and technology uh, collide. Um, so we want to see uh, manufacturing coming back, steel manufacturing coming back, and we believe that the circular economy is a good model for that uh, because it emphasizes maintenance and repair and remanufacturing as opposed to new. It emphasizes uh, uh, a, a way of, of checking, uh, keeping demand in check and not uh, doing mass production that ends up in waste. Of, the idea that it tries to eliminate any waste leads us to uh, other processes than automation and again mass production of uh, 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 cheap uh, products and it has a major advantage in creating jobs uh, because uh, the small loops, so there are several ways of keeping uh, products or materials in different loops where recycling is the last one that, uh, that you want because by the time you go to recycling you have uh, uh, exhausted many other better options and many times recycling it gives you something that is of uh, poorer quality than uh, the original uh, product. So uh, think about it, repair which it's almost impossible to outsource has to be done locally so uh, all these processes are labor intensive. They use very few material and energy resources and, and as they are decentralized, they benefit regional economies by providing local employment. Thinking in the context of sustainability, we're always trying to optimize these three factors, economic, ecologic, and social. And that's a, a quote from Walter Stahil, who is one of the main thinkers of, in the uh, circular economy um, thought um, he's been talking about, about it since uh, uh, the 70s. Um, so we're delighted that uh, finally the concept is getting traction uh, worldwide uh, in America too. Uh, and uh, we're doing our uh, utmost best to make it a reality in Indiana. That's why we're organizing this series of uh, local uh, meetings throughout Indiana. As I mentioned today, we're in uh, Gary. Uh, last time we were in uh, Lafayette. Uh, and speaking of Lafayette, I will pass uh, now uh, the mic to uh, Austin Castle to talk us a, a little about his excellent work in sustainable agriculture.